Hello and welcome to Spirit Pig. This is the show that explores how to live a fulfilled life. I'm Duncan CJ and today I'm talking to Kirsty Hanley. Kirsty is one of the UK's top cognitive hypnotherapists and personal development coaches based in Harley Street in London and has worked with some of the world's leading coaches. She writes regularly for the Huffington Post and is a highly sought after speaker who was recently invited to present at TEDx in London. Her passion is in helping people to let go of their blocks to success, unlock their potential and to create the life of their dreams. Thanks so much for being here, Kirsty. Lovely to be here. <laughs> I looked at all those amazing points and there was there was plenty more I could have added to that, but I thought I'd keep it short and sweet. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsty, for anyone who's watching this and um, isn't 100% familiar with the term, what, what is cognitive hypnotherapy and how can it be used to help people? So cognitive hypnotherapy, um, I guess, is kind of an umbrella term that encompasses lots of tools from different disciplines that all work with a person's unconscious mind to allow them to let go of some of the blocks that they might be experiencing in their lives. So um, I'm trained in uh, NLP, in hypnosis, um, positive psychology informs a lot of what we do. Um, a lot of the latest kind of um, studies on the brain and neuroscience and, and uh, neuroplasticity. Um, there's lots of things that all kind of pile into the mix. Um, and I get people from all across the board coming to see me um, who basically want to have a better experience of life. Um, and, you know, our unconscious mind controls about 90% of what we do, which to most people, you know, yeah. that feels quite, quite big. I remember seeing see that statistic and, th and that was a bit of a shock. 90% is crazy. Yeah, right. So we kind of feel like we're consciously driving the car. Um, but there's all kinds of other stuff under the surface that, that really comes in. So what I do with cognitive hypnotherapy is I really work with that stuff to allow a person to be able to move forward more powerfully in their life. And that word you mentioned, um, plasticity, this is, this is that a phrase that means that it is, it, we're not stuck in our way. We're not, we're not fixed. Actually, yeah. we have these, um, we're, we're conditioned, we, our mind, you know, works in a certain way, but it is, it can, it can be changed. If anything, you know, all these habits we have, it's not to like, oh, that's my lot. It's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. It's, the brain's plastic, plastic, plasticity. And so it yeah. can actually change and you can, if you can do something, you can undo it. Is that right? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we used to believe way back that around about aged 18, our mind was fixed, you know, our brain had grown to what it was going to be. And that was it. And we were kind of stuck with it. And you'll often hear people from sort of older generations kind of saying things like, you know, it's just who I am, you know, and um, not to this old generation, you know, <laughs> they're some of the most, <laughs> most You just alienated mindsets. all of our audience. <laughs> <laughs> flexible mindsets are in the old generation, obviously. Um, but, you know, traditionally, I'm thinking my grandparents, you know, there was this kind of idea that the way I am is the way I am. Um, but no, now we know that literally you change your mind, you, you create a new habit and you get these new neural pathways that are created that mean your brain grows differently. Mm. So you create a new habit and you're, you're, you're changing the format, you're changing the structure of your brain. So it's, it's really exciting when you start to see it like that, you know, nothing has to be stuck. We actually have the possibility to change the cells, to change the way things are happening. And the, the job of the uh, our, our unconscious mind, it, its number one job is to protect us, keep us safe, avoid danger. Yeah. Um, but like, however, like the unconscious mind can often be like over, like way too overprotective, isn't it? And actually, almost a hindrance. It starts saying, "Ah, oh, danger!" Like public speaking, for example, danger. Um, like trying out something new, danger. And so, yeah, is 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 that? Yeah. What, so, what is this overprotectiveness of the unconscious? Well, you know, if you, if you think about it, your, your unconscious mind's job is to be really black and white about things. So, for example, if you were to step out in front of a moving bus, your conscious mind doesn't want to be intercepting going, oh, am I going to get hit? Am I not? Am I going to survive? Am I not? You know, you just, bam, want to be out the way. So the job of your unconscious mind is to make these really definite decisions about how to protect you and how to keep you safe and how to get you out of the way of that moving bus really fast and safely, you know. Um, and because of that, you know, often what happens is it, it gets it wrong, basically. It, it, it starts perceiving, your mind starts perceiving situations as being threatening when actually they're just kind of everyday situations. Um, and this is, this is something that I, um, you know, I do talk about quite a lot is this idea that that 10% of your conscious mind 
is able to assess, like, am I actually going to die in this situation? You know, you can kind of look at, you know, am I going to stand up in front of these people and die whilst I'm talking? Um, or am I going to be all right, probably? <laughs> and so at that point, you can kind of step in and you can realize that you don't necessarily have to take every um, uh, fight or flight response, that, which is what kicks in, you know, when you're under threat as a signal to, to run away. Um, yeah. And is this, um, how exactly is this unconscious mind sort of programmed? Is it at times of like extreme and heightened emotion? Is that when the unconscious mind is often like susceptible or because I've heard this phrase of like creating anchors. Is this all connected with the idea of creating positive and negative anchors or is that two separate things? Am I confusing? Yeah, things? no, that, that is relevant. Um, there's a there's a saying in my business, which is neurons that fire together, wire together. Right. So. Um, so what often happens is if we have a really strong emotional response, our mind takes a snapshot of what else is going on around us. Um, I think I used an example in my TED talk, which was for me, my big fear was public speaking. And when I was really little, I stood up on a stage, um, I, something went wrong, the audience laughed. My mind took a snapshot at that moment of the audience laughing and my strong emotional response, which was embarrassment, and sealed the two things together. Um, and then forevermore sort of kicked off the fight or flight response, which said, get out of here, you're going to die, <laughs> you know? which clearly wasn't true. Um, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. So, so we anchor very strong feelings into our body. You know, anchoring is something that we do all the time. An anchor is just when... Um, yeah, when a strong feeling gets connected into our body somehow, we have visual anchors, we have smell anchors, we have feeling anchors. Um, For example, and yeah. you, you, you smell, you smell, I know, a smell and that can immediately trigger, okay, I'm 11 years old, my mum's just bu um, baked like a cake and we were outside in the summer with my grandparents. So you can immediately, it just triggers You're something there, or right? you hear something and it immediately takes you back to somewhere. Is that, is that what an anchor is? Yeah, that's what an anchor is. Like, I have one with spaghetti hoops remembering my grandma in Coronation Street. <laughs> Just the way it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's slightly different from the sort of phobic response. But yes, we do anchor those um, states into our bodies very, very strongly. Um, and it is possible through the tools that I use in cognitive hypnotherapy to unhook those responses. Um, there are some really specific things that I do with my clients that just mean that they no longer have to be triggered by those um, those early events that have caused the problems for them. So it's about identifying, okay, which anchors necessarily, okay, your, the spaghetti hoops in Coronation Street might not be holding you back, but there might be another one, like the public speaking one, which is, is this anchor, is this serving me, or is it actually holding me back? And so to identify that... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I would separate anchors off from that in a way. Anchor, anchoring is something a little bit different okay. in NLP, um, often used for positive states. There are lots of strong negative anchors and we can collapse anchors um, to, to release those. Um, but yeah, um, the, 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 phobic, the phobic states are much stronger. You know, those are sort of where the, where the fight or flight response kicks, kicks in so strongly that people feel they don't have a choice but to get out of there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I work with people with all kinds of I, I see less and less people now with sort of pure phobias. But when I first started working, I would see quite a lot of people with pure phobias. And, you know, there's been people that I've worked with who are so terrified of spiders that just the shape of a spider's leg in any inanimate object that they see triggers them into that response. You know, it can be so severe. A phrase that I heard, um, which was um, on um, one of a video that I saw that you created, um, was this idea of, and you often ask your clients to uh, um, ask themselves it, who would I be if dot, dot, dot. Can you maybe just explain the power of this phrase and asking yourself it? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I really uh, believe strongly in is that uh, most people, in fact, I would go so far as to say all people, are not achieving to their sort of highest potential of who they could be. Um, and what, you know, even, and I'm talking here even about super high flyers, you know, there's still limiting beliefs and kind of fears that hold everybody back. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is when you work with those super high flyers, like what else are they going to do? You know, what else can they achieve once they're free of some of that stuff? Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that who would I be if phrase is, it allows you to almost put on a different jacket and just to imagine what it would be. Um, how would you be acting? What would you be 
saying differently? How would you be moving differently? What would you be asking for differently in your life if you were not afraid, if you believed you could do it, if you were free? Um, and so that's one of the most powerful things that, that I find with my clients. It's about kind of bouncing forward into the future. You know, we can clear the negative stuff. We can clear the difficult stuff. And then what else? Like, who would I be if I really believed deeply that I was good enough to be here? And dot, dot, dot. And then you can almost, so rather than just to what, eliminate that from the outset, being like, oh, uh, I'm not good at public speaking or I, I can't do this. If you ask yourself, okay, who would I be if I was confident or who would I be if uh, I did believe in myself, dot, dot, dot. And then is, is that future pacing? It's like, yeah, it's a, it's a type of future pace. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really, really great way of getting somebody. I mean, uh, because I'm trained in the way I am, I can do that in a kind of trance state and it's um, like awesomely powerful. You know, it's amazing because you can really get someone to feel, you know, like, uh, and, and they can, you know, most people know, most people can say like, I can't do this, but that person over there, they're great at it. You know, they can really do this. And so, um, they're able to, to kind of, see the features of what it would be like to be able to do their thing so say with public speaking you know you might be able to get somebody to really inhabit like what how would I be standing differently if I felt confident you know it might only be an inch back with my shoulders but I, that might bring me up just a little bit and maybe if I made eye contact with somebody in front of me here or um, who would I be if um, I breathed more easily whilst I was giving the presentation how would that open me up differently um, and even just as simple as like if I believed I was good enough what else would I be creating because you know there's that theory of you can have anything you want in the world if you're willing to ask a thousand people for it you know um, and most people stop at around five I reckon I like that <laughs> something like that I haven't that. heard that before I really like that it's lovely, isn't it? So, you know, like who, if you believed you could do it, what else would you be asking for? If you, if you were in that body, if you were being that person, what else would you be doing? And the great thing about that is that when you've really inhabited what that feels like, um, in that moment, a person has created that experience for themselves. They are already that person. Like, that's the newsflash. Like, you are that person right now. You've just made that, you know? That's, that's you. So what else? <laughs> like, who would you be if you were that person? What else would you be dreaming of? And then it, things get really exciting. That's awesome. I know what I'm doing later. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, what is the phrase, because um, I heard it written a couple of times, what does the phrase leaning into your fears mean? Okay, yeah. I remember when I was crafting my TED Talk, somebody did say to me, like, they're not going to understand what you're talking about. No, no, no. In... <laughs> and I get that. I get that, because it's a, it's, a, it's a strange one, isn't it? But what to be fair, I, mean... I do know what it means, because I read the whole article. I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was beautifully written, and it's very oh, clear, don't I? I was just like, you. oh, what does the phrase leaning into your fears mean? Yeah, well, you it's a good it one to talk about. It's, very clear. It's, a, it's a really good one to talk about, because... Um, it could mean lots of different things to different people. But to me, what leaning into your fear means is, so you've got your edge of fear and our automatic sort of response is to run the heck away from that edge in the opposite direction. And by leaning into it, I just mean kind of like pushing towards it just enough, play, dancing with your fear, I guess, you know? So you can feel it and you start to feel the power of who you can be because here's another like phrase but you know everything you want is on the other side of your fear right so you have to you have to understand that um that there. in order in order to get you you know to where you want to be you're going to have to make that leap and it's going to stand sometimes like it's going to feel sometimes like sort of standing on a precipice and kind of like I'm leaping to where, you know, that's, that's the fear that people have is like, what's on the other side? What's going to catch me? Am I going to die in the process? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's almost like just leaning towards it enough, you know, enough, not too much that it wrecks you, <laughs> but enough that you don't have to take it seriously anymore. And just keep finding your edge, keep finding more of your edge and lean in towards that, you know. And then by, by leaning into it and just to be doing it and, um, does that remove a lot of its power and its hold over you? For example, like, do we have an idea that something is a lot scarier, bigger, like, 
more dangerous worrying than it actually is. And so by constantly leaning into it and pushing, like leaning up against the boundary, does it actually like, wait a sec, I'm, I'm doing it. It's not actually as scary as it is or... Is it- yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, so I'll share with you here. So the TED talk that I did, that was the first time I ever spoke in public, right? I mean, I'd done a little bit of t- I'd done stuff on the run up, you know, to it, um, testing the speech out and stuff. But that was the first time. So when they called me, so I, 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 I really lent into my fear there big time because my first response was absolutely no way. <laughs> they saw my article, they called me and asked me if I'd do it. And, um, uh, you know, I was laughing because I, I, I said, well, you know, no. And because of that, absolutely yes. So what happened was I lent into that fear. So, you know, that was like a big fear for me. As soon as I'd kind of gone for that, everything underneath it, totally no problem at all I was you know I was calling up my friends like who can I speak in front of how can I you know how can I get myself out there more everything else dissolved you know and and I really see that in my clients that you kind of go for the big stuff and everything else you know it 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 just becomes like smoke it just kind of evaporates um so yeah so I really kind of feel like it's a good thing to to embrace to walk towards the things that that terrify you as long as they're not fast moving traffic <laughs> that's interesting that just what you just said there just completely reminded me of um about a year or so ago i was went to some uh, some coaching day with a guy called dan latto and he was putting off this idea of running a marathon forever and it kept on he was like no it won't happen it won't happen and then he made a decision actually i'm gonna do an iron man rather than a marathon like this huge crazy thing and so suddenly, like, you know, a few weeks later, he'd just done the marathon because that was no longer, the marathon was tiny. He was now going for an Ironman. And so just by going for those, it's kind of, I, don't know, I guess it's the kind of like reach for the stars, you'll hit the moon kind of um, thing. But that's, yeah. that's really interesting. You suddenly now like said yes to a TED talk. Okay, God, you've got to go out there and just be doing Everything speaking else. events constantly. <laughs> Everything else is super easy. And I was afterwards, I was thinking, oh, you know, what else am I going to do now? I'll just apply for another one and maybe I'll, you know, go and sit and speak at the UN one day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I think, you know, people do feel that it's this big thing that's so, you know, everyone does. You know, if you have a big fear about something, you feel like it's absolutely huge. We can look at other people's fears. And kind of, you know, shrug and go, yeah, what, well, you know, get over it. You know, that's what most people's reactions are is like, why can't you just deal with that thing? You know, um, but it's big to them. It's really big and it looks really real. It looks really scary. And they're telling themselves some really scary stories about what that fear means to them. And they're buying into those stories. I, I often joke with my clients, like sort of say, you know, so this thing, you're telling yourself a really, really, like a horror story about it, a really scary story. And then you're getting really frightened like, and you can't sleep, so you're, you're so scared. And then you're wondering why you're scared. Like, it's because of the stories, right? So you have to deal with the stories. Um, but yeah, you know, those, those things that seem big to other people, you know, don't necessarily seem big to us. And once they start to, to drop away, most people look back at those fears and kind of go, wow, you know, they, they lose this connection with that person that they once were. Yeah. And that idea of you just mentioned, um, this is a story I'm telling myself. Um, a, a thought is a thought is not an instruction, is it? A thought is a thought. And so when, when you realize that a thought is not an instruction, it's not like every thought you have, you've got to actually, that's your instruction, that's what you got to do, to actually, what, step away, remove yourself from it and actually see it for what it is? Is, is, that, is that correct or is that... Is that yeah, right? well, you know, we can, we can buy into our thinking. Our thinking, you know, our thinking, we are thinking beings and we can meditate and we can do all the stuff that people do to sort of slow down the thinking and deal with it, but ultimately we're always going to have thought. Mm. Um, but we can create a situation where we kind of are able to step back enough from the thought that it, we don't buy into it as real because you know we're making everything we experience you know you and I are, are looking um, at certain things at the moment and we probably if we were to, to have a chat about what our computer screens look like and um, whatever we'd probably come up with similar interpretations but really we're just seeing that through our thinking and we're making it up we're making it up we're making it all up everything we experience and so you know through our senses, our thinking seems incredibly real, you know, like it's, it's a thing. But actually, um, when we stand back from that, if we're able to just really step back and just go, it is 
a thought. I mean, it sounds so simple and kind of slightly crazy when you start to, to sort of say that, but, you know, it is just a thought. None of this is real. So we could take it seriously and really bite into it, or we could take a time to pause and realize that each thought we have isn't an instruction. You know, we have a choice aside from that thought as well. Um, you know, that if we get crazy thinking, we don't have to buy into that crazy thinking. We have, I guess, ultimately, we have a chance to uh, create a story that works better for us. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, now, I, I, should I see it, say this one? Yeah, as in, I, I suddenly often find myself, I spend too much time quoting the person, because I literally, because I'm often on people, your Twitter, people's Twitters and Facebooks, and I keep on hearing these amazing quotes, and I'm just like, right, well, I, like, I can only quote the guest, like, maybe once, maybe twice per interview, but <laughs> I'm going to quote you one more time. Is that Okay. All right, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? It's a good one. <laughs> Slight longer, but it's. It, to be fair, this one's not really a question. I just thought it was a good. It was kind of a good statement, so I just wanted to just to say it. But you said, um, uh, "We all have a reason for doing what we do, but most people are living to their default setting, reacting to life rather than creating life as they would like it to be. To discover your purpose is to become lit from the inside. I just love that idea. I just I love that idea of being lit from the inside and. I don't really know that, like I said, it's not really a question, but I just wanted us to say that out loud. Do you, do you have anything it's to add good. to that or did I just sum it up yeah. well? Well, I, no, I like that quote. That's a good quote. You, you're, you're impressed by yourself. <laughs> you sent it to me. I'm really good. I'll, 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 send, I'll send it to you afterwards. I'll send your, your own quote to you. That sounds perfect. Um, yeah. Okay. So being lit from the inside is uh, like what I am the most passionate about. That's for me, everything I do with my clients, that's the ultimate goal that you can let go of just exactly what you need to in order to connect with yourself more deeply and to find that place where you can feel lit up and you can feel excited and feel really connected to yourself. Um, I guess some people would call that finding your power, you know, finding who you can be. Um, but yeah, I love that. I love that lit from the inside thing. And you can see it, you know, you can see people when they change from living that default setting, you know, that default life. Because it's kind of like a train track, you know, it's like we can, we can just go down the, 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 the train track that our life is taking us on and not really make decisions about whether to steer it any which way or the other. Or we can just be consciously aware of where we're going and we can start to create our experience. Um, and, you know, in leaning towards your fears and, in, you know, all of that stuff um, and in letting go of old limiting beliefs and, and really just, um, I guess, signposting your destination, you know, choosing the destination, um, then, yeah, you can start to live a much more connected, powerful life where you really can be lit from the inside. Well said. Very beautifully said. <laughs> And now just a couple of speed round questions, which we finish off uh, every interview with. Um, what does a fulfilled life mean to you? Well, really, it's just that, what we've just been talking about. You know, it's like when you're really connected to yourself, um, when you're, you know, I, I was going to say when you're realizing your potential, but, you know, who knows what your potential is. But when you're kind of stretching, I think growth, being continually in growth rather than in protection um, leads to fulfillment. Um, and the more you can connect to yourself and connect to other people, and feel that that inner light, then uh, the more becomes possible. That's cool. And uh, what is one thing all our listeners can do today that will have a massive positive effect on their lives? <sighs> oh, can I pick two things? You can pick. <laughs> I say okay. one thing. You can pick twenty so, things. We'll, we'll give you we'll give the top. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, um, the thing that I would say, is do as much as you can to enjoy being you. Be you. Um, because most people spend a lot of time trying to be something else, trying to shape themselves into what they think society expects of them. Or, but when you really connect into who you are, you just know, you know what's right for you and, um, and you know where you can get to and you know where you're holding back. Um, and if you need help with that, then, you know, there's lots of people that you can talk to, coaches, cognitive therapists, whoever it might be, you know, to really help to, to move you forward. Um, and the other thing is just that kind of leaning into your fears thing, you know, it's like, do, 
um, I, I almost have like an inner klaxon that goes off now when I feel a fear. It's like, oh, that means I'm going towards, <laughs> you know, that means I'm saying yes. Um, I've got a, a friend who's got uh, who does lots of TED talks as well. And his thing is say yes more. And I think that's a great, a great slogan, you know, to say yes to the things that previously you might have run away from and just feel who you can be. That's awesome. <laughs> definitely. I'll be, I'll be doing both those things. Definitely more. Um, this is, this is the, 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 doing these interviews. It's just like a massive coaching session. I've got, I've got a to-do list of so many new things I need to be doing. <laughs> And are there any books or resources which have changed or had a big impact on you? Yeah, well, there's so many. I mean, gosh, if anyone wants to contact me, actually, for more than I'm going to say now, then I'd be more than happy to share because I, I really do have big lists of things. But um, the two that really stand out for me are um, you're Jack cheating. Cranston. You're cheating a lot on these. You're, dub you're doubling <laughs> every one. <laughs> no. All right, I'll <laughs> pull it right back. No, no, so Jack you... Fransky has a lovely book called Somebody Should Have Told Us, um, which is all about what I was saying earlier about standing back from your thinking, not buying into your thinking, and there's all kinds of other things around it. It's based on something called the three principles, which is a really lovely um, methodology um, that's by theory. Sorry. Um, sorry? Who's, that? Who's that by, sorry? Zach? Uh, Jack, Jack Pransky, oh, P-R-A-N-S-K. KY yeah um he's wonderful um and the other book is a book uh by a guy called Mark Matusek, Matusek um called When You're Falling Dive um which is beautiful and it's just all about that kind of um in times of difficulty fall into it and see where you fly to um it's it's a lovely lovely book Amazing. um there are loads of others but no I love those because I haven't often similar ones come up uh, quite a lot and I haven't heard of either of those two so I'll definitely read both of them thanks for those and finally how can people stay in touch and find out more about you so you can contact me via my website which is www.kirstiehanley.co.uk um, I will shortly be launching another website actually which is purely for my coaching which is inspiringlivescoaching.com um, and, um, yeah, I can be contacted through that. Um, feel free. There's, there's contact forms on both of those websites. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone who either just wants to kind of let me know how they're doing in their life and how, how they're moving more towards that being lit from the inside and the power of who they can be. And if anyone would like to, to have a conversation about working with me, I always, um, offer a, a deep conversation before anyone signs up to work with me so we can kind of see if we're right to, to work together. And it's a really exciting thing to, um, to see where you can go from and to, it's a lovely, lovely experience. Amazing. Kirsty, thank you so, so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. I've learned huge amounts personally and uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. See you soon. Bye now.